Have you always wanted to catch a Yeti? I don't mean, like, catching a real Yeti. I mean, do you want me to review the movie to catch a Yeti? Well, you're getting it anyway! To Catch a Yeti is a movie from Dandelion Productions, a small company that still managed to hire some noticeable names for this project, even if they aren't used properly. The director here is Bob Keen, who won multiple Saturn Awards for his work in Hellraiser, Candyman, and even Dog Soldiers, but as a special effects designer, not a director. For writing, we have Paul Adams and Lionel Schenken, who only have four writing credits combined, on top of some other crap they worked on. In any case, this movie has always been on my back burner, since I want my turn of covering it after seeing others do it on YouTube. Now let's dive into this lackluster movie so we can learn how to catch a Yeti. I should first note that the copy I'm using is kinda low quality, but it's the best I got. And get a load of this music. When the moon hangs high on the breast of the lake, the bite of the wind is like a slap in the face. A legend of horror lurks in the haze. It's Bigfoot. Hey Reggie, I think this guy wants your donuts. Bill! 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 So anyway, Blubber here is working with a man named Big Jake Grizzly, played by Meatloaf. And there's some confusion since the song is referencing Bigfoot, who is totally different from the Yeti, but at least it realizes the mistake and focuses again on the latter. For hundreds of years, this legend has grown. At the top of the world, it's the Yeti that's known. Well, whatever. Maybe they'll take the time to build the mystery and legend of this incredibly scary- Oh, wait, there it is. It hasn't even been two minutes, and already we have a full view of the creature. In Harry and the Hendersons, they at least built up to what Harry fully looks like by hiding his face a bit, but that's not the biggest problem, honestly. This Yeti looks like a kobold or rat creature with big feet. The movie's special effects feel like something from the 80s, despite being released in 1995. Even Harry and the Hendersons looked more up to date, and that was released in the late 80s. Anyway, our two human characters try sneaking up on the Yeti while it's eating... Pine cones. Blubber then sneezes to cause the creature to... start sliding on its butt? Oh wait, I see it sliding with its feet. <laughs> well, even in poor quality, I can tell how bad the special effects are. The Yeti then hides in this tent that belongs to two other people, who happen to show up and ask why these two bad guys are searching their stuff. Jake and Blubber manage to get out of trouble, but they need to look for the Yeti without going back inside the tent. Do you doubt me, Blubber? Huh? No, no, I guess I expected some big hairy monster after following those gigantic footprints all this way. Why is such a tiny creature like that got such big feet? So he doesn't sink in the snow when he's walking. That's why, Blubber. Give me the binoculars. I like how he's lampshading the common depiction of the Yeti as this big, scary monster. And to be fair, it's still a unique creature, so catching the Yeti could net some money and fame. The campers later pack up and unknowingly stow the Yeti into their luggage. They are taking a plane back to New York, and this is where we learn more about one of them. Meet Dave Bristow and his wife Kate. With daughter Amy, they'll be the main family of this movie but they still didn't notice that they're lugging around a rare creature. They only realize this as Amy leaves a slice of pie on the floor for some reason. It went behind the chair. Oh. It's okay, honey. It's all right. I'm not gonna know who ate your pie. What are we gonna do? I mean, we can't just leave it there behind the chair. I don't know. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. What is it? What do I look like? What? Is, isn't there someone we can call okay, or something? We can't call somebody. It's against the law. I could go to jail. I think the police would excuse you for finding a freaking Yeti, even if it was on accident. For now, the family is trying to feed the Yeti. Not sure about giving it processed food, but... Then again, I'm no expert on its diet. The creature at least trusts the family enough to come out of hiding. But before we can focus on that, 
we get the Grizzly meeting his client, the Sturgeon family. They want him to find the Yeti for their son, Wesley. So where is it? Give me it! It's not here at this moment. You'll have it soon, son. I better! I don't! I'm gonna make your lives hell! Too late. They're already there. Oh, good lord. Those are some massive feet. Not even the Yetis in Warcraft had feet that huge. Dave then remembers those two hunters he talked to during the camping trip, and reasons that Grizzly and Blubber were looking for the creature. But they can wait when the Yeti starts running a fever, since the home is way too hot for someone like him. Amy tries to cool it down by getting it to eat ice cream, and the family eventually solves this problem by sticking it inside the fridge. Though, you sure you want to leave it open like that? Won't that overload the mortar? Marge, can you set the oven to cold? Well, now we're at the point where the creature is becoming more of a problem, as it starts eating up everything inside the house. And Amy isn't exactly making herself endearing with how she introduces all of her toys to the Yeti, but this gives her a chance to name him Hank after a toy she once had. This is while the hunters try getting more info on Dave's identity, with bad effects aplenty. Hank? <laughs> or are you gonna be trouble? It's impressive how they were able to get the effects to work in most situations, but in moments with chroma keying and really fast movements, the whole film falls apart. Grizzly then figures out the family's whereabouts, because there are only so many climbers in such a small town. Okay, fair enough. And he founds out where their house is by sweet-talking a receptionist in this camping store that Dave owns. I should probably go on up to the house and see his wife, Kate. That's a good idea. Yeah. The address slips my mind, though. Oh, no problem. It's Summer Haven number 634. Well, now I'm gonna have to kill you. No witnesses. Anyway, Hank wants to go outside, but is doing so with Grizzly closing in. The hunter isn't being subtle about what he's after, so Amy tries hiding the Yeti upstairs. This is all while her parents are out of the house. So these two have to wait it out until they come back. Amy escapes through the window, but Grizzly catches her on ground level. Not sure how she could get down without literally jumping down and hurting herself. Dave finally makes it back home with the help of his cop friend from before. He was also camping with him. But they're too late. The hunters have taken away the Yeti. Well, based on Amy's testimony, they figure out that Grizzly used a limo that belonged to the Sturgeon family. But that's not enough to get the cops to investigate them. The guys at headquarters would kill themselves. But they broke in here, terrorized Amy, and took him by force. An illegal animal, Kate. Imported illegally. You make a stink about this and you'll have a lot of awkward questions to answer. Again, they didn't know they had it. And aren't you his friend? Do something, you worthless cop! Well, because adults are mostly useless in this world, it's up to Amy to find her Yeti friend. We then cut over to the Sturgeons, where we see just how big of a sociopath Wesley is. What's wrong tonight? Yeah, and if you notice the little hit counter near the power box, He's been doing this for some time. Mind you, only two of them were electrocuted, but still, even the parents know he's a psychopath. Dave and Kate then realize that Amy is missing, so the cop helps them by driving them to New York. Turns out Amy is searching for Hank during the day, while Grizzly is showing the Sturgeons the Yeti he caught in the evening. That's what it looks like anyway. Man-eating monsters that prowl the Himalayas? They don't exist. But a Yeti? A Yeti exists. And that, right there, that's a Yeti. I want to say Meatloaf is the only actor who's trying to sound convincing, but it's not really doing it for me. At least he's the only one willing to threaten Wesley. You say one more rude word to me, and I promise you this, I'll throw you across the room. You idiot! In a case where this brat is a literal psychopath, I'm okay with the antagonist doing this to show that there are lines he won't cross. 
So the parents arrive just outside the Sturgeon building and find Amy crying just nearby. Did she fail to get in? Who knows? The parents say they need to get Hank before taking the train to Albany. So for now, we have more of Leslie being a psycho. Dave decides to bust into the Sturgeon's home by pretending to be a customs officer. And while he deals with the bad parents, Amy and Kate go to save Hank. Get up to me! I'll give it to you, all right? That felt so good. It's a nice change of pace from backing a protagonist who's as scummy as the bad guys, don't you think? But even after dealing with Wesley, the family now has to deal with Grizzly and Blubber. So now Amy is on the run with appropriate music. There she is, Mr. Grizzly! There she is, Blubber. I'll be giving a reward, Chief. Uh, say, a thousand dollars. Ten! Wesley! Make it $10,000. Thanks, Chief. And if you ever need a favor in the future, yes, I'm sure there will be an occasion. Well, of course the rich influence the police to do their bidding. Then again, with how things play out, it doesn't even take long for the hunters to find Amy and Hank. All the villains did was cross the street from where they last saw her. Quick, Hank, use the skateboard! <laughs> Both know that Amy's a clever girl. She knows we're catching a train at 6.30 at the station. I'm willing to bet she's going to head there. So you're saying we should just go there and wait for her? Hey, what else are we going to do? Parents of the year, people. Oh, hey, Amy convinces this karate man to help her. Is he going to beat up Blubber at least? Interesting. Blubber. <laughs> okay, one point for Blubber. Amy makes a run for it after finding Hank. Because everyone in New York knows about the reward money now. They hide in an ice truck, which is good since the Yeti is burning up again. And after a while, when they get stuck, the drivers hear Hank screaming and at least have enough sense to let them out. With the family reunited, how are they going to slip past Grizzly and Blubber? I know they're on this train. I know it. Check that way! Check that way! Check that way! Stop it! Come on, get him to stop! Well, at least the villains couldn't get on the train. Sounds like the door opening sound effect from Zelda 64. Anyway, the hunters tell the Sturgeons to send the police to wherever the family might go. And we see that Wesley wants to come too. The parents are more than happy to let him, so long as Grizzly has an impromptu babysitter bonus. Because again, they really hate Wesley as much as we do. Just think, a whole evening, maybe more, without Wesley. <laughs> Why don't we go away? Grease. Do you remember Grease? On our own? Oh. I'll make those calls to the police. Uh, first, haste. Pack our bags. We're leaving tonight. Grizzly then figures out that Dave's family has regrouped and is hiding in his winter cottage. The bad guys then wait till nighttime to strike, meaning our heroes get a little bit of downtime before the climax. We're gonna go in when they're asleep. We're unarmed. And surprise is our weapon. Do you have a problem with that, Wesley? There's a shotgun in the trunk. A shotgun? My father never goes anywhere without a shotgun. Hundreds of people hate him. Again, psychopath. So when night falls, Amy and Hank sneak out of the house after seeing Grizzly and company breaking in. This leads to the parents being taken as hostages, but... Here's where the movie starts to get weird. I'm going to let the following scene play out entirely. Because for a movie that's been safe for kids, this one moment feels like something out of an entirely different flick. There will be mood whiplash by the end, so pay attention. Just give her a little more time, Wesley. Just a little more time. She's starting to get cold back now. Fear start to sit in. Just a little more time, Wesley. 
She's gonna be hammering at that door. She's gonna be begging to get in. She's gonna be begging to get in, Wesley. Begging. Wow, hey, that's great. Yeah, tonal, tonal whiplash. The only way it could get more awkward is if I threw this in. She's gonna be hammering at that door. She's gonna be begging to get in. They're eating her. And then they're going to eat me. Oh my god! She's gonna be begging to get in, Wesley. Begging. Well, Hank, that's great. Well, the baddies decide to go out and look for Amy and Hank, only to fall to their traps. I guess we can call this a reverse Home Alone. They even start a fire in the house despite her parents being there, but it's okay. Hank is also inside trying to free them. Grizzly gets knocked out in all this commotion, and Blubber... Oh no! <laughs> as bad as that looked, that was still funny to me. While the family gets away in their jeep, while the baddies are pursuing them in the limo. Here is where the heroes decide to return Hank back to the Himalayas, where he's from. This decision makes Amy sad, but she understands why they're doing this. On the other side, the villains are trying to chase down the family while dealing with Wesley's incessant whining. But it does pay off in the end. I can't believe how incompetent you are! That little girl has outsmarted you all along the line! And now you catch your parents, and she outsmarts you again! World's greatest under my foot! More like world's greatest jerk! Let's go, kid! Let's well, Stay cool, kid. Considering how his parents hate him, I'm going to chalk him up as dead from hypothermia, at least by the time this movie is over. This leaves our heroes with one last obstacle, the customs. Amy tries to pass off Hank as a toy, which doesn't quite work since they have to get past the machine. But don't worry, Blubber does a stupid thing by rushing in, guns blazing! Women got their brains! God gave a garden slug! You two sandwiches short of a full picnic! Your lights are... What do you want? What do you think, my rabbit's foot's loaded? Ooh, I'm scared now, boy! And that's seriously how the villains get dealt with. We're just left to assume they're arrested. So the family takes Hank back to the mountains, where he gives them a pine cone to say thanks. And after we get one final cutaway to the Sturgeon family, we see Hank waving towards his newfound friends. There is wonder in most everything I see. Hey, that's not the Carpenters. But that's the movie for ya. Feels like an extended corny PSA. Minus the PSA and Richard Horvitz. Putting aside the quality of the film I was using, this really does seem like something made for television given the cheapness of the special effects. But it does get a good laugh out of me sometimes for how awful they are. And seeing bratty rich kids get put in their place never gets old. It's just a silly, dumb, and harmless flick. And with this next movie coming up, you'll come to realize that one can do a whole lot worse. But until then, I'm the Media Hunter. Media is my prey, and reviewing them my way. I'm on the 